Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manifest. My name is Brad, and I'm so glad you could join us this morning. Okay, I'm sure you're all wondering why I've got the TV on behind me. Brad, shouldn't you be in church? Yes, but the Olympics are on! Which means this TV will be on for the next two weeks. Go Canada! I love watching the Olympics. And as a kid, I even dreamed of going to the Olympics. I'm sure many of you did too. So for fun, please let us know in the comments section which sport you wanted to compete in. Maybe it was hockey or gymnastics, the luge or the skeleton. Seriously, those guys are crazy. Maybe it was speed skating or weightlifting. Well, for me, it was boxing. I dreamed of voluntarily getting my face punched in to represent Canada. Believe it or not, I competed as an amateur boxer for about five years and had some success, but the closest I got to the Olympics was being able to represent Team Alberta at the Canada Winter Games in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. And I can tell you, it was a great experience. Plus, I got to take two weeks off of school don't worry, my education wasn't hampered. Boxers aren't that smart. Did you know there are currently about 67 different Olympic sports? And I enjoy watching all of them. And cheering on Team Canada, I'm sure you do too. Again, for fun, please comment on the sport that you love to watch the most. For me, I love to watch the track cycling, the triathlon, another sport that I've competed in, and obviously boxing. Now I agree that the 100 meter dash may be more exciting to watch than the marathon, or the weightlifting a bit more engaging than the marathon swimming, but I know I can be caught yelling at the TV during any event, Canada, Canada. And I think we know that we are the best sofa referees. I'll be calling offsides during the rhythmic gymnastics or too many men on the field during the synchronized diving. But the thing that I love most about the Olympics is how it brings our country together for a common goal. Watching and cheering on Canadian athletes and seeing them step onto the podium as we celebrate together as Canadians. And I think Jesus wants this for his church too. We've all got different strengths and weaknesses. We've got different skills when it comes to spreading the gospel but we're all on the same page when someone gives their life to Jesus and steps into his kingdom and we cheer them on and celebrate together as Christians. Welcome to Manifest. Good morning, Manifest kids. It's Miss Shauna. What a beautiful day we're having today. I hope wherever you are, whether you are on vacation somewhere or you're camping or you're at home, that you are just taking in God's creation and the beauty of it. I mean, isn't this incredible? I've got my garden here and the flowers, the grass, and even today it's a pretty blue sky and there's not a lot of smoke. And that's again, something to be thankful for. So let's dive right in. So we are in the final chapter of Ruth in our summer reading challenge. And thanks Mr. Stephen for doing such a great job last week in chapter three. I get the pleasure and privilege of talking about chapter four, which kind of brings the whole story together. So in chapter four is when Boaz goes into the city and speaks to the family redeemer that he had talked to Ruth about previously in chapter three, has an amazing conversation, and in the end takes Ruth as his wife. After that, after he takes Ruth as his wife, she becomes pregnant and she has a son that they name Obed. And long story short, they are part of the lineage of King David. So that's just like a real broad kind of stroke of chapter four. So let's go through the questions together. The first question is the light bulb. What's the light bulb that's I found cool and interesting in this, this chapter of Ruth? Well, in the whole book of Ruth, Boaz has just really stood out as such a man of honor. And here again, he could easily have taken Ruth as his wife but he knows the steps to best honor the family 
honor Naomi and her family um, and honor the process way back then of what all happened to honor each other. And so I find that really amazing and interesting and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later on. So the fact that, you know, he was in the city and he went to the town gate and took a seat there and wouldn't you know, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So he just came by. I think that's another really cool and interesting God thing because I know that God will have led that family redeemer past Boaz so that this conversation can happen. And then for him to gather witnesses together to say, hey, this is, this is the process. These are the steps that we need to take. And if you're willing to do it, I will, I will 100% support you. But if you can't, know that I'm here and I will take that on myself. So the question marks, confusing questions about a character or a situation. I don't know if it was confusing, but I found it fascinating. And I think that it'd be really cool to do some more reading about um, different traditions back in the day. But in chapter, where are we here? They were talking about witnesses and they were talking about in order for the transaction or the agreement to happen, to hand over a shoe um, from one redeemer to the next. And so that is what had happened. Part of, so in verse seven, now in those days it was custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove a sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. So the other family redeemer drew off his sandal and he said to Boaz, you buy the land. And I find that kind of curious and I'd like to know a little bit more about what was the significance of handing the sandal over from one family redeemer to the next family redeemer? So that was a little kind of question mark that I had in my mind. And last but not least, arrows. What are some actions and things that we can take away from this? And I think one of the biggest things that uh, I took away from this um, is a big reminder of the importance of not always going into a situation or a conversation based on how I think it should go and the results I feel should happen. Um, to also take a look at who else is there, whether it's friends or family, and honoring them and making sure that the decisions and the choices, first of all, that I'm going to God and that I'm asking Him for wisdom and leaning into Him, and also taking into account um, my family and the people or my friends or whoever I'm in that situation or conversation with and how can I best honor them? How can I best go through this with them and how would, how would honoring them best look? Um, whether it's how I talk, what decisions are even made, making a decision together, can look in so many, many different ways. And so I think for me, that was a takeaway because I think we can quickly kind of go, well, I feel like it should go like this, 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 and this, and we should make this and this and this decision. And that's not always the case. You know, whether you're at home with your family or you're on the playground even, and you have a disagreement with a friend, take a moment and I wanna encourage you to look at your friend and kind of go, well, how would they feel in this decision? How would they feel if I do this or if I say this? And kind of frame and think about how you might change the way you say something in that situation. So that's the end of Ruth. What an amazing book. Ruth has shown me so many things every time I read this book. Just the, the honoring, the obediency, the willingness to walk and support regardless and be sacrificial in that. She has taught me so much, as I'm sure she has taught you. I think we're forever changed with the heart of Ruth and the heart of Boaz and even the heart of Naomi and how she, was, how she walked through all of this and how she was just in awe and supported Ruth bringing her into a new country and a new homeland. So much to learn, so much to take away. What are some things that you took away? I encourage you to um, either write them down or talk to your family about it. If it's something that you can even do and take a picture of yourself doing that, do it. And then hashtag summer reading challenge or manifest kids summer reading challenge in it and send it to us. That would be awesome. 
Well, I look forward to talking to you again in a couple of weeks. Take care, enjoy God's creation, and see you later, kids. you now. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So I am so excited to speak today because I get to speak on a topic that I'm passionate about. And so about a year ago, Brad asked me to speak and he asked me to speak on connecting the dots. And so what that means is connecting what God is up to in his pursuit of us. And so the last time I spoke was in February and I started to prepare for that message and I realized that the topic of Connecting what God is up to in his pursuit is just so big. And so I ended up doing a, kind of a laying the foundation for today. And so in that, I talked about his pursuit. And so that God speaks, and he speaks all the time. I laid a foundation for the why and the how. You can connect to him in, your, in moments in your day. So through the good stuff and through tough stuff. And so I preface today with those same truths that God is actively involved in all of our lives. He is speaking and he is moving. So today I'm gonna take it a bit deeper and not only do we connect to his pursuit, but we connect what he's up to in his pursuit of us. And so I start today with two questions. Have you ever looked back on your life and realized that something you went through ended up being a part of a magnificent teaching or shaping then now the pain of those events fails in comparison to what you now get to walk in? Or are you sitting sitting here today in a major thing that has happened or is happening, knowing it has or is going to impact or shape your life, but you don't know in what way yet? These kinds of questions I'm passionate about because it it draws us into God's heart for us. So you see, we all have stuff in our lives that's in this now but not yet space between restitution to something or being restored to something. Or we all have stuff in our lives that's, that, that is in the space of having our eyes open to who we already are in Christ. Brad puts it this way, God's love wants to go where it isn't. In Colossians 1, 15 to 20 it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of of the cross. He is in the business of turning death to life. So he's, he's working to take us deeper and reconcile those things to himself. I want that. I want his love to permeate those things in my life. I want that space that I'm in now and those things that haven't yet been touched to be restored. There's so much more and I want that to happen. So I feel like understanding the why we would want to connect what he's up to in his pursuit of us helps lay the foundation for us so that we could enter into those deeper places. So I'm going to explain the why and the how this morning, but I'm going to start with the why. And in order to do that, we're going to look at a man in the Bible. I love his story. His name is Joseph, and his story is in Genesis 37 to 50. And so that's a a long portion of uh, scripture, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, What I'm going to do is read parts of it and then recap uh, different parts of his story. So we're going to start in Genesis 37, 2 to 11. It says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Biliad and Zelpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, that's another name for Jacob, he loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. 
because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, you were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose above and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And we told it to his father and his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind. So his brothers, um, sometime after this, they go pasturing uh, the flocks in, in the faraway pasture. And Jacob tells his, uh, his this was Jacob, uh, Joseph's son, tells him to go and uh, find them and bring a report back. So it says in verse 14, he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So Joseph goes and he finds his brothers and they see him coming from afar and here comes the tattletale. Here comes the favorite. So they take his coat and they sell it. I mean, they not sell it, they sell him into slavery and where he ends up in Egypt. They took his coat and they put blood on it and they showed it to his father. And so his father thinks that he is dead. Joseph becomes a slave in Potiphar's house an officer of Pharaoh, and he, after some time, he finds favor there, and he's left in charge of the, all of what Potiphar had. And so Potiphar's, sometime after that, Potiphar's wife frames Joseph for something he didn't do, and he ends up in jail. So, again, after some time, he finds favor, and in Genesis 39, 22 to 23, it says, And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison, Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. And so, uh, sometime after that, he interprets two dreams for a cupbearer and uh, a baker of Pharaoh. And he asked the cupbearer, remember me when you get out of here. And again, it wasn't until a few years after that that the cupbearer uh, remembers Joseph after Pharaoh had two troubling dreams, and he remembers Joseph as being this guy that could interpret dreams. So Joseph is brought out of uh, the prison, and he's brought before Pharaoh, and he interprets those dreams, which then brought the message that there would be a famine in the land for seven, in seven years for seven years. Joseph is put in power after that point. He's second in command to Pharaoh himself, and he oversees the, the counting of the grain in these 14 years. It would be 13 years from the time he was sold in slavery to the time that he became second in command, and then at least 8 to 10 more years before his brothers show up to buy grain because the famine had hit them. When they show up, they do not recognize him, and they bow down just as his dream. So it'd be 20 plus years before he was reunited with his family and this dream coming true. So throughout Joseph's story, he is in this not yet space between reunited, being reunited with his family, being, having these dreams come to pass, and experiencing more of God's heart for him. His story beautifully outlines four aspects as to why it is important to connect the dots. So I'm going to jump right into those. Uh, the first one is healing. Why would we want to connect what God is up to in his pursuit of you? It's because when we start to connect, we find out that we're not alone in the midst of the things that we go through. He loves us, and that old stuff that, that is still in there, he wants to take that and, and to heal it and to, to make it clean. 
And you see, when we make those connections, we can enter into what he's doing in that. In Joseph's life, like I said, it was 13 years before he was elevated to second in command. His situation didn't always change in that time, and sometimes it got worse when he was thrown in jail. And Joseph had some, so much loss. Uh, when he was sold into slavery, he, he lost his family. He lost his father. He lost his language, his cultural identity. He was alone. And this sense of not being found, he didn't know that his father did, thought he was dead. And so he could have thought, like, why didn't his father come looking for me? He was left with this, did his family care, and the rejection of being sold by his brothers. We can follow a theme that God was up to in his pursuit of Joseph and how he made that connection. So in Genesis 39, 2, it says, this is when he's in Potiphar's house. It says, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter here. It says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. So the Lord was with him. He found favor, and the Lord was with him, so he was left. He was sold. He was rejected, and here it is that he's found. God is healing that desire for his dad to come, and, and that is repeated throughout his story. So it's significant then. So if you look in 39, 3 and 4, it says, His master saw that the Lord was with him. So even other people are seeing that God is with him. And that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. And again, in verse 39, 21, and 23, this is when Joseph is in the jail. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. So he's taking it deeper, showing him love, and gave him favor in sight of the keeper of the prison. At the end of 23, it says, the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. God was showing him that his incredible steadfast love and he was showing him abundance in his circumstances of love and favor and not being alone. Rather than being bitter, Joseph took this into himself. He took this healing into himself and the sense of the Lord being with him and the Lord loving him and the Lord found him to the point that he names his kid Ephraim. And this name means God provided for me in my suffering. He would have missed that if he didn't enter into what God was up to in his pursuit of him. So that brings me to the second point that I have of why we'd want to connect what God is up to in his pursuit. And that is it strengthens our faith. You see, God is in the business of strengthening our faith. When we see all this stuff connect in our lives, it draws us into his heart. He works things to take us deeper. And when our faith is strengthened, we can then have hope to walk into those things that he wants us to walk into to heal. And so there comes this incredible cycle of healing and then walking back in and strengthening our faith and then healing and just this incredible thing that he's doing. That when we can begin to expect God in the midst of the unexpected happening. Which brings me to the third point of why we'd want to connect. And that is direction and purpose. It could be an overall direction on your life, or it could be for a season. For Joseph, he had this direction for his life from the dreams that he had. And even though he may not have known what they meant at the time, he could have had insight, we're not sure, he, he did interpret dreams. But when his brothers came and bowed down, in that moment, he would have seen that direction in, over his life. But in the midst of that, God has purpose in the things we're going through. And for Joseph, there was preparedness going on. And so when he was in Potiphar's house and in the jail, he was learning about money and how to manage groups of people, which would come into play when he was second in command and counting the grain out. And so this incredible connection of what God was doing in his life. Same is for us. When we look back on what God has done in our lives and we see connections, there's purpose in the things that we go through. God is making something beautiful out of ashes, which then helps us not pull away when it is something hard he's asking us to walk through. And that brings me to the fourth thing. God gets the glory then. 
when stuff lines up, it's all you can do is know that it's God. Joseph having to face rejection and the pain of it in this foreign land, when he was connecting, this incredible love story is unfolding. But this story becomes a story of God's redemption. You see, Joseph didn't get to look back like we do on his life, but we now get to look back on his life, and what God was up to in his pursuit of Joseph was not just for the heart of Joseph, but the line of Jesus was saved, because one of his brothers is in the genealogy of Christ. So Joseph could have become bitter, and he could have turned his family away, but God worked on his heart, and he made those connections, and he, he let that healing take place, and the line of Jesus was saved so that you and I could come to him. And God gets the glory. So I always, after I, I hear the why, uh, I'm, I'm like, okay, yes, I get it. That's so cool. And then I start asking questions, and I'm like, okay, well, what does that look like practically? H- how do I do that every day? What, what does that look like when I'm, I'm out and, and things are happening in the moment? And how do I connect the dots? How do I connect what God is up to? And so I thought I would um, answer the how this morning with a word and a story. So how we connect what God is up to, the word I'm going to give you this morning is the word treasure. Treasure, by definition, is value highly or cherish. So then the word doesn't mean discount. Rather, it means hold on to, see what happens. Maybe a word sticks out to you, a number, a dream, something that is repeated, things that you can hold on, these things we hold on to and we meditate on them. So I'm packing that a bit further, this sense of treasuring and meditation. I'm going to give you four things that you can do in your day-to-day. First one is ask questions. When something sticks out, you could ask, God, show me what this is for. Or what do you want to say to me in the midst of this? Or you could simply start with, what are you up to in my life right now? After asking questions, there's this pondering, uh, going back to, to it once in a while and seeing what God is up to. In Proverbs 2, 1 to 8, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my big commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call for insight and raise, up, raise your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, and he is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of of his saints. When we start pondering, it's that deep inside that we start seeing things happen. And and then it brings us to, so we ask questions, we ponder, and then we look for it. So this could be in your day-to-day, looking for what God's doing and those themes that he's doing in your life. Or it could be looking back and making those connections. So this habit of looking back and seeing what God is up to. I preface that with, it's not living in the past, but it's making those connections. And then I can see what God is up to, and, and, I, and I can walk back into it, and, and then he gets the glory. And the last thing about treasuring is remembering it. So maybe that looks like writing it down for you. Sometimes I buy something and I hang it in my car that I can remember a theme that God's working on, or I, sometimes I buy a ring and I wear it to, to remember that thing. And, and whatever that is for you, it's, it's the act of remembering Because sometimes what God is speaking, it it speaks directly and it answers things in the moment, but sometimes it fits in later. The key is to remember so that you can make those connections and enter into it. So I'm going to unpack that a tiny bit further. So I gave you the word treasure, and now I'm going to share a story with you. I I can't share what Joseph's thoughts were, because 13 years of his life was one chapter in the Bible. So I don't know what his thoughts were and how he made those connections, So I'm going to share a story from my life that has been unfolding that follows the same theme. You see, like Joseph, 
God has been healing rejection and loss in my life. And it's so cool, the story I'm going to share with you, because it actually was happening at the same time that I was preparing this, and I saw some of those cool connections that were going on. So you see, I grew up where love was modeled different than Jesus' love. It was conditional love. So what that meant is you had to do something to get it. And the standard of what that was changed, and it could change daily. So what love then meant is that you could lose it at any time. See, I'm in that now space right now that between being opened up to God's love and there is a reshaping going on in my life. And over the years, as I've leaned into connecting the dots and taken risks in what God has been doing in his pursuit of me in that love, incredible things have happened. And here's just a piece of one of those incredible stories. A few months ago, I was sitting in a book club meeting, and I cannot tell you what we were, we were uh, talking about. I, can't, I cannot remember. All I remember is a question that was asked about the book's content. And that question was, how have you felt deeply loved lately? And I sat there and I was like, deeply loved? And it just struck me. What is deeply loved? I had all these questions. What does it look like? I mean, I feel love in moments, but what is deeply loved? What does it feel like? And so I knew that was the next place that God was taking me. And so I treasured that word, and I held on to it, and I started to pray about it, and I pondered it and started to ask questions, and I wish I had time to share with you every moment of how God is pursuing me in that theme of deeply loved over the last while. Uh, There's just some incredible stories, uh, to the point where someone would send me an email, and it was all about love, and they have no idea this is what God has been speaking in my life, and they just like, God told me to send this to you, and just incredible stuff like that happening, but the story I feel that I'm supposed to share with you today to show you how to connect the dots in treasuring has to do with three men and a hike. (laughs) I love hiking, and this is actually one of the pictures that I took on one of my hikes this summer, and I have wanted to uh, join a hiking group for years, and so I decided to try and find one this summer, and I was talking to a lady, and, and she invited me to her hiking group. So I sign up and thinking that that's, that Saturday when we were going to go, she was going to be there and I didn't know anyone on the hike. So I show up to the parking spot and uh, I didn't know that the lady was sick. And so uh, I get out of my car and it's just me and three guys that I don't know. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, I was told they were nice guys. So I'll, get, I'll go on this hike. So um, we, we go, we We get to the hike, and I am so glad I did because of what God did on that hike. Um, So we're hiking along, and God has been doing all this stuff in my heart and in my life, and I felt like I needed to be honest with them about something that I find quite embarrassing in my life, and and, but it's something that I don't want to hold me back. I want to experience life, and I want to experience creation and experience God, and And so that thing that I I needed to be honest with them was, I'm in the camp of people that is afraid of heights, yet I love to hike. And so uh, I was like, okay, well, I need to share this with them in some capacity. So um, what that looks like for me, it looks different for everyone. But for me, when there's a drop-off right beside the trail, the ground starts to move, and I actually feel like I'm falling or going to fall off. And so then what happens is it's like, it doesn't even, my brain doesn't even know I'm doing it, but I just start getting lower because the ground just seems so much safer. And so I instantly, I could be standing and then I'm on the ground. So um, so this is, I was like, okay, they need to know that if this happens, like I'm going to be fine. It's just, it's just something I have to work through. And so I tell them a version of this at some part in the trail. And and so we keep hiking, and, and we get to a place where there is a drop-off, and maybe for them it might not have been, but for me it was. And then in the same spot, there's um, rock, a kind of a rock face that you have to scale up to get to the trail above. And to them, it might not have been scaling. Uh, they kind of just hopped right up it, and they were up there. And I'm grabbing on rocks for, like, dear life, getting all dirty, and crawl up onto the top of it. And, and I think to myself, how am I going to get down? <laughs> like, now that we got up here, and so I, I say to them, I voiced this to them, and I was like, could someone go before me when we come back down? And, and that way, then I'll just be looking at you and not so much the drop-off behind me. And 
So we do the hike, we get up to a fire lookout actually on that one, and we come back down. I don't know we're at that spot. And so two of them, as we approach it, they go running down the rocks again, and they go like this, and they make a wall at the bottom of it. And I was like, okay, and one of them's at the top. And, and so I turn around, and I'm backing, and I'm like, again, grabbing on. And, and one of the guys at the bottom, he comes over, and he just starts telling me, put your hand here, put your foot here, and he guided me down it. And it was incredible. All of a sudden, it was as if the three guys were not even there, and it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit surrounding me. And God said to me in that moment, Carla, I deeply love you. This is what it looks like. I love you so much that even though you're afraid of heights, you don't have to change that for me. You don't have to try to be someone different. You don't have to hide who you are, but I love you so much. And so, um, just, I love how God works in that way. Um, this, a deep healing took place in that moment. And on that hike, these three guys accepted me in that, and God accepted me in it too, and it was just this incredible moment. So from the book club meeting to months later, where God was showing me his heart by three guys in a hike, when we connect those dots, it becomes this beautiful dance between you and Jesus. If I had not been looking for it, I would have missed what God was doing in his pursuit. When we connect the dots, it draws you into his incredible heart in ways you can't even imagine at this moment. In all this treasuring, it makes these co the connections of what God is up to in his pursuit of you an act of responding. See, God is active and moving, and our relationship with him is not stagnant. We all have stuff that needs his love to touch it whether it be coming to him for the first time or something that needs to be healed or a fear that we need to overcome so that we can step out. He is with us in that reckoning as we experience more and more of who he is or step out in who he has created us to be. I am surrounded on every side can't see the light of day but i am persuaded beyond all hope you won't let go of me i stake my claim on every word you say you will not be late and i will sing through fire darkest of weather though I can't see I still believe you're good so I'm moving forward through crashing waves I know I'm safe with you you hold my life you hear my cry with every breath inside I will see through fire and thunder Cause you were on my side I trust you with my life I know my story It isn't over Even against all odds You are a faithful God That's who you are your promises will hold together and I will dwell in the hope of the Lord forever I am convinced that your promises will hold together 
fruition yet God that you are faithful and you never fail us and we pray that you would just help that truth to rest in our hearts today in Jesus name 